Hi, welcome to chapter 35. Um, hopefully we'll get this all done in one video because it is a pretty short chapter. If I stumble through anything, I just got done with uh, 10 hours of work and an hour drive each way. So uh, please forgive me, I'm a little tired. Um, so the endocrine system is composed of ductless glands throughout the body. These glands secrete hormones into the bloodstream and those hormones go to a target organ to exert their effect. There are eight major endocrine glands. <clears throat> The pineal, pituitary, thyroid, thymus, adrenal, pancreas, ovary, and testes. And hormones can be of two different types. Um, the first is lipid soluble, and those are able to get into the cell, actually into the cell through the membrane and bind to receptors in the nucleus of the cell. The second type of hormone is water soluble, and those bind with the cell membrane receptors on the cell membrane and exert their effect by activating secondary messengers. Secondary messengers within the cell go to the nucleus and they basically deliver the message. It's as simple as it sounds. Um, the best known second messenger is cyclic adenosine monophosphate, also abbreviated as CAMP. Um, so, moving on. Um, Hormones have a lot of different effects in our body. Um, for example, the one they give is um, growth hormone. Lack of growth hormone causes dwarfism, whereas too much hormone, um, whereas lack of thyroid hormone causes cretinism. Too much growth hormone would be, a, I think the word is giantism, but gi it would basically be somebody who is taller and has bigger bones and bigger structures than most normal average human beings. Um, there are two major therapeutic uses of hormones. In cases of hormone deficiency, the missing hormone is given as a replacement. And in the, uh, on the other hand, um, certain disease states, various hormones produce beneficial effects when given in large doses. <clears throat> um, an example would be an allergic reaction. There is no deficiency within the body, but corticosteroids are given in an allergic reaction to help the, to help the inflammation. So. We're going to go over the hypothalamic pituitary axis, and again, don't get too sucked into this, don't get overwhelmed by it. Um, I just want you guys to kind of get an idea of where these hormones, how these hormones are getting secreted. So the hypothalamus um, is in the brainstem, and it's connected directly to the pituitary gland, which is often called the master gland, because it controls many of the other endocrine glands. So the pituitary has a front and a back, anterior and posterior. Anterior is corrected, connected directly to the hypothalamus through something called a portal vein, and the posterior kind of sits on its own. So the hypothalamus controls the master gland, and each lobe of the pituitary gland is controlled in a different manner. So the hypothalamus communicates directly through that um, blood vessel to the anterior posterior or anterior pituitary gland, um, and it produces releasing and inhibiting hormones. So the releasing hormones that it um, sends to the pituitary gland are thyrotropic releasing hormone, corticotropin releasing hormone, and growth hormone releasing hormone. Lots of hormone being used here. And that stimulates the release of hormones produced in the anterior lobe, such as TSH, ACTH, growth hormone, and insulin-like growth factor. There's a couple others mentioned there. We're not going to get too deep into the reproductive system. Actually, we're not going to cover it at all, so I wouldn't worry too much about those. The hormones of the anterior lobe is known, are known as the tropic hormones. They're released into general circulation to control the activities of other endocrine glands. Um, with the exception of growth hormone, which can kind of act all over the place, these hormones um, stimulate an individual gland of their own. The hypothalamus produces inhibiting hormones that suppress pituitary secretion, so it prevents the pituitary gland from sending out those hormones. Examples are um, somatostatin and prolactin inhibiting hormones, um, and somatostatin basically stops growth. So the hypothalamus all produ also produces the hormones that are retained in the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, kind of like a storage place for them. The posterior lobe, it says, is the extension of the nerve tissue of the hypothalamus, so basically they're one and the same, not necessarily connected by a vein. Um, the hormones that are produced for the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland are oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. These travel down axons um, 
into the posterior lobe from the hypothalamus where they are stored until needed. So instead of um, secretion of the posterior pituitary hormones is controlled by nerve reflexes instead of releasing hormones. Okay? So three different groups of hormones actually control the endocrine system. The inhibited, releasing or inhibiting hormones that are released by the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, the tropic hormones which are released by the anterior lobe, and the hormones from each of the other endocrine glands. The mechanism that controls the release of most of these is negative feedback. So what will happen is the pituitary will release a hormone that tells the adrenal gland to release a hormone. Once that hormone is high enough, the pituitary gland can sense that there's enough and thus it shuts its own mechanism of action off. So it's a loop um, that basically kind of feeds into itself. Once there's enough, the pituitary knows it doesn't have to do anything else and it's done. So intuitary... <laughs> Again, I'm sorry, guys, I'm really tired. Anterior pituitary growth hormone. Growth hormone, which is also called somatotropin. And if you guys can kind of get the idea, tropin means to build or to grow, whereas statin means to stay still, to not grow or to stop growing. So growth hormone, GH, also called somatotropin, is referred to a general hormone that regulates the growth and maintenance of all body tissues. We're not... Again, going to dive too deep into that. Just remember, um, if you have too much growth hormone, gigantism is a result. Hypersecretion of growth hormones in adults, um, that's, that's in children if they have too much growth hormone. Not enough is dwarfism. Hypersecretion of growth hormone in adults, if something were to go wrong in adulthood, causes acromegaly, which is thickening of the bones and soft tissues, um, especially noticeable in the hands, feet, and face. There's a picture on five of this on 593, um, page 593 in your book, which is actually kind of cool looking, um, kind of gives you an idea of what could happen to someone should they develop this problem. So growth hormone used to be taken from human cadavers. It is now able to be synthesized. We no longer have to rely on human cadaver donors, um, which is a good thing because we, if you read in your book, when it was being taken from human cadavers, there were diseases that were associated with that donation, whatever that person had, as far as, especially, and they mentioned Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, which is, which is mad cow disease, you could end up with too. So the products um, for synthetic growth hormone are called humotrope, genotropin, and nootropin. And they're really only given um, for children that have severe deficiency um, in growth hormone. Somatostatin, which again means to stop growing, is an inhibitory hormone produced in the hypothalamus as well as some other places and it inhibits growth hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone. Products you might see on the market are called octreotide, sandostatin, sandostatin LAR which is a long-acting version and octreotide would really be the most common one. Um, these are synthetic as well and they are used in the management of acromegaly in patients who had inadequate response to surgery or cannot be treated with surgery. Clinical indications for these, as we just talked about, um, clinical indication for som somatropin is long-term treatment of children who have growth failure because of lack of endogenous growth hormone. Um, they cover a drug I'm not going to talk about, macassarmin, because it's not too common. Um, octreotide is used in the treatment, as we discussed, of acromegaly. Adverse effects of these medications are just extensions of the normal physical, physiological action. Changes in blood sugar level, which can go either way, consistent with insulin fluctuations may occur. Um, headache, muscle weakness, knee and hip pain, transient edema. Um, some people do develop antibodies, but it doesn't affect the response to the medication. Diagnostic test for abnormal anterior pituitary function. We are on page 593. So w sometimes we need to assess how well the pituitary is functioning. So we'll give some a medication called cosentropin to um, basically figure out if it's working or if it's not working. In order to assess the growth hormone, I just want to make sure I'm on the right page here because I think I might have skipped ahead. Um, of a spike. You guys don't have to get too deep into the diagnosis of, sorry, we're not going to talk about cosentropin here. It's in another section. Um, 
ignore that section. I wouldn't worry too much about it. You'll probably never have to do anything dealing with it. Um, it's for your information only, but it will not be covered in a test. Um, we'll be moving on to chapter 36 in the next video, so I'll see you soon.